Hi, I'm Ellie May O'Hagan. I'm here in Imperial College in central London with Open Democracy UK. And we're here today for the State of the Economy Conference, which is being held by the British Shadow Chancellor, John McDonnell of the Labour Party. The point of the conference really is to talk about the economy in a way that it hasn't really been talked about for the last eight, eight years. So we'll be looking at investment, public services, rebalancing the economy away from the financial sector and that kind of thing. But really the reason we're here at Open Democracy is to see what's going on inside the conference, what debates are being had, what issues do people care about, why are people here. So join us and we'll go inside. The fixation with shareholder value and short-term short termism results in our giant corporations sitting on giant cash piles, piles perhaps up to 700 billion pounds at the moment. Instead of investing that money productively or creating new jobs and opportunities, these corporations are hoarding cash. And those responsible for running them are paying themselves obscene amounts of cash. The ground up, we can start to transform how capitalism in Britain works. Previous Labour governments were content to only think about how to redistribute income. Today, technological change means we have to think more closely about ownership as well. I've spoken before about moving beyond the Tory right to buy and creating our own Labour right to own. And I think this could be at the centre of our office in Britain. A radical decentralisation of economic power and authority back to working people and local communities. He served as a consultant, listen to this, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, the European Investment Bank, as well as, yes, Oxfam and various United Nations agencies. He regularly travels all over the world to give lectures like this one today. So it's just an absolute privilege to have him speak to us today. Hardrian Chan. Somehow the Tories managed to convince many people that this deficit was basically due to overspending on welfare by the former Labour government. There's no evidence for that. Now this reframing has, however, allowed the Tories to do a number of very significant things. First of all, it has enabled them to reduce the size of the welfare state. Something that even Margaret Thatcher didn't quite manage. You know, she I mean, uh, cut a lot, but still uh, the welfare state when she left office was only marginally smaller than what it was uh, when she came to power. But this government has done that. Moreover, this uh, reframing has enabled the Tories uh, to undermine the principle of solidarity that is at the heart of the universal welfare state through their divide and rule tactics. So we're here with Harjun Tang, who gave the keynote speech this morning at the conference. So what do you think should come out of a conference like this? Well, I think uh, this is an opportunity to basically reset the agenda for economic policy in this country because uh, in the last 20 years, uh, 30 years, I mean, the country has been totally dominated by this uh, free market neoliberal uh, policy agenda. So do you think that um, ordinary people should be involved in economic policy making? Because that's really the aim of this conference is to bring people who aren't familiar with e economics yeah. into conversation with people like you and to create policy out of that. No, absolutely. You know, I'm of the view that uh, it is actually not just uh, the, a kind of pastime, but a duty for any responsible citizen of a democracy to learn economics, because uh, so much of uh, the debates that we are having are about uh, economic issues. Uh, even in the uh, areas that, that were traditionally you know, detached from economics, like education and BBC, I mean, they, they are the, the relentlessly Kind of uh, pursued by you know so-called economic logic, so it's uh, very important that uh, all citizens are aware of uh, basic economics and they actively participate in the economic debate. Because uh, you know, otherwise, uh, what's the point of having democracy? You know, if you are going to leave everything to the experts, you know, the, what's the difference between say Britain and North Korea? But politics at the moment has. Would you say that it's shut people out of economics? 
Oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, I mean, you know, my view is that uh, economics uh, these days uh, play the role that the uh, Catholic theology played in medieval Europe. It's basically become, doesn't have to be, but uh, has that, uh, become an ideology that justifies whatever is going on. Yeah? You know, the, the, some people are uh, very rich, uh, some people are starving, but that's uh, how things uh, should be. Yeah? I think one of the most staggering kind of points you made was that the poorest 10% contribute a greater proportion of tax than the richest 10%. That's morally unjustifiable. And then tax relief predominantly go to the wealthiest. And then the other point about you know, the 120 billion pounds that should be collected in tax, that should be going into our public services. And I've almost never seen in much of this sort of more right-wing press reporting about aid and you know, isn't it awful that we're sending loads of money to places in aid. Never seen that put into the context of the capital flight that's going out of those countries because of these uh, tax avoidance schemes and this kind of thing. And um, we might think that that's a rather important context to set. We're not just talking about tax havens like the Isle of Man, but I was speaking to somebody just in having coffee before here who was a businessman, but also an active Labour Party member, saying that people he knew had moved to France, you know, Ireland, he mentioned the Isle of Man, which is called a tax haven, but we're also talking about other countries which are not thought of as traditional tax havens. The extent to which that is a problem and the extent to which we cannot divorce uh, the idea about fair tax from harmonisation. It, it is in the best interest of the UK manufacturing sector to remain part of the European Union. The economic challenges are, of course, political challenges, and the debate is really about choices. It's about ideas and it's about priorities, and they're priorities for all of us. It's about investing and building a sustainably growing economy, and that's the challenge really for our uh, generation. And these are challenges and opportunities that transcend our immediate discussions about any EU referendum. They'll be with us whatever the result on the 23rd of June. And their roots, of course, lie in the absolute abject failure of this neoliberal experiment. Such is the dominance of the austerity narrative that economic credibility has now laughingly been redefined as a willingness to comply with a policy that's delivered neither sustainable economic growth or improved living standards for the overwhelming majority of people. So you're here today to talk about gender in the economy. How do you think the economy is failing women? I think at the moment the economy is uh, focusing very much on making the wealthy wealthier. There's, uh, uh, most of the economy seems to be tied up in house prices, making house prices rise, with actually very little thought going into creating new jobs, um, creating jobs that last and pay. And as we see from you know, steelworks closing, etc., the government are really, really, ha are really happy just to let kind of uh, working class jobs just disappear from areas, and very, very happy to see the economy focus almost entirely on London. And what that means for women is that women are earning less, you know, we, we, we've actually seen a wage gap rise in the past few years, um, and women are, are seeing less money in their pockets, so if women's rents are rising and uh, their benefits are being cut, and they're in low paid work, and they haven't seen their wages rise for 10 years, they've actually seen a real terms decrease in, 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 in their wages and what they can use to support their family. So why did you come here today? Um, I feel that... Um the government has a real lack of imagination and courage um, when it comes to thinking about how to rebalance the economy, for example. Um, they, yeah, they're entirely reliant on sort of going back to the same old strategies of debt fueled uh, growth um, and it's just building up huge risks for us. Um, do you think like conferences like this are they useful to you know create debate within the progressive movement as well as absolutely and I think particularly when it comes to finance and the economy because far too often people think that they're not experts so they're not qualified to talk about it or they're not allowed to have an opinion but when we look at society uh, none of us are sociologists, or many of us are not sociologists, yet we have an opinion on society. Many of us are not musicians, but we have an opinion on music, and it's a similar process. It, the economy is so integral to all of our lives. Are, are these conferences the good places for getting the party's message out? Arguably not, in that you're sat in a room talking to people who already kind of agree with you. Well, why did you come here? 
Um, I'm a politics student. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I came here because I'm a, I'm a Labour, Labour Party supporter, and I think it's it's a important to understand exactly what they're standing for, what their policies are, and b it's it'll be it'll be interesting to see them be challenged. There's been quite a lot of really interesting, really thorough policy questions being asked. So I think. Um, as a place for progressive people who want a different kind of economy to come together and debate, I think it's been really interesting and really positive. What I've seen less of is just ordinary people who might be affected by current economic policy really coming here to talk about it. Um, I know that it's happened in a couple of sessions, but generally speaking, I think most people who are here are already politically engaged. Which is a shame, but I don't really think that you can blame that on this conference. I think that one thing that keeps coming up when we interview people is that ordinary people have been shut out of economics for a really long time. So what about job losses? It is clear that artificial intelligence will replace routine, repetitive and algorithmic work. According to the economist Brian Arthur, this is the second economy where computers transact business only with other computers, and this will replace around 100 million workers globally. So the robot economy is already here. Public investment in social infrastructure. This is important as our physical infrastructure because we don't just have an equality deficit or an ecological deficit, but we also have a care deficit. My um, advice uh, to our uh, Shadow Chancellor and Treasury team would be take care of employment, decent pay for men and women, and ecological sustainability, and the budget will take care of itself. This is Keynes <laughs> rephrased in the 21st century, uh, taking into consideration our needs. <laughs> So that's it. Uh, the conference is drawn to a close. There's been dozens of speakers, 800 people. It sold out in 48 hours. There's obviously a massive appetite to talk about this kind of thing. Where it leads to, we don't know. But thank you very much for joining us and hopefully we'll find out. <laughs>